This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howey, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. Killing neck snares are cruel devices that experts and scientists have shown to be ineffective and inhumane. Yet they remain commonly used across Canada, particularly in targeting canids like wolves, coyotes, and fox. A new documentary series, Trapped in the Past, is challenging why killing neck snares remain legal to use, what impact they have on wildlife, and how a lack of updated regulations puts wildlife, people, and pets at risk. The series, the result of a partnership between the Fur Bears and Exposed Wildlife Conservancy, features John E. Marriott and Kim Odland, co-founders of Exposed Wildlife Conservancy, as they explore the issues of trapping and interview experts, including trappers. To share more about the experiences that led to the development of the documentary series, what viewers can expect, why they chose to not show graphic images, and how everyone can make a difference to protect wildlife, John Marriott joins Defender Radio. As always, let's start at the beginning. I think as we, we talk about Trapped in the Past, the project we're all very excited is, is I think at the time of release, the first episode will be out and the second episode will be queued up. But how did this whole process start for this incredible documentary series that we're seeing now? You know, it really started with me way back um, when I first started running into trappers, which happened in the Yukon in the late 1990s, early 2000s. I had a friend up there, I'll just call him Trapper Ivan, um, who I would go and visit. And and it, mm-hmm. I was fascinated by the world. I hadn't really, you know, other than sort of watching the Jeremiah Johnson movies as a kid, I hadn't really yeah. known much about the world of trapping, I hadn't been exposed to it much as a kid, even though my dad was a hunter and, and an angler. Um, so when I first sort of got the glimpse in with Trapper Ivan and, and got to go visit his cabin and see all these pelts hanging there and hear the stories and started to get fascinated with it. And I started to look into it a little bit more and read a few books on it. And then it really took off once I started doing my wolf projects, um, in particular, the Kootenai Wolves, which started in 2012. And as I was doing that project, I started learning that there were wolf trappers set up right on the boundary of our national parks in the Ooh. Canadian Rocky Mountains, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it was just a total shock to me that these wolves could be protected for 90% of their life and step one foot out of the boundary and be baited yeah. into this snare saturation site. And I didn't even know what this was at the time. You know, I remember the first time I walked in and going like, the hell are all these wire loops all over the place? Yeah. And it was just such a shock to the system. And at that point, I really started to dive deep and learn more about trapping. And that's when I first introduced the issue. It was probably 2014, 2015 to Kim Odland, who's my co-founder with Exposed. And from that point, we started thinking about, okay, at some point, we're going to do an episode on this. And as Exposed has kind of evolved and has become an actual conservancy and a nonprofit and developed a relationship with the fur bearers and and used the tremendous resources that you guys have at your fingertips and that you guys have, you know, this 70 years, 80 years worth of experience on this sort of stuff. Ooh. And it has allowed Exposed to, the, to go to the next level and start going, okay, let's let's actually do a series, let's actually do a campaign And in partnership with the fur bearers, we have created this campaign that's going to be aimed at some very specific asks. And I think that is 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 really going to um, open the eyes of the Canadian public. I think it's going to be kind of like when I first walked in to that first snare saturation set, it's going to be a shock to a lot of people um, that, you know, part of it is even just that that this is still going on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people realize just how vast trapping still is. And yet right now it's not a livelihood anymore. It's just a, a, a recreational commercial hobby. It's an industry um, that is really filled by recreational hobbyists. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we're going to be exposing in it, uh, in this little documentary series that I think is going to um, really open some eyes. And, and I think it's going to start turning the tide to really start putting more pressure on, you know, we saw that, 
in the uh, anti-trapping advocacy uh, world back in the late 1990s when we finally got, and I, and I wasn't a part of this, so I shouldn't say we, but when Canadians finally got uh, steel-jawed leg hold traps banned, and you know, that was a 30, 40, 50 year fight. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we're much further along in the process this time, and that as we start to educate the public and they get more and more involved in this, um, that it's going to be a much quicker turnaround this time because we've seen it recently in things like grizzly bear hunting. Um, yep. We've seen Prince Edward Island just recently introduce something to the legislature asking for a ban on trapping. We've seen Scotland just ban snares. We've seen California ban trapping altogether. So there are all these precedents that are out there now. And that gives me a tremendous amount of hope that with these videos and with this campaign, which is going to include a whole range of social media, um, it's going to be ongoing beyond these first three videos. And I, I'm just really hopeful that we're going to start to see some change and some reform in trapping. Um, and that's really the, the bottom line of all this. That's why we're doing it. But something you mentioned, and I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, and I think you have a very unique perspective on this as very much a modern outdoorsman uh, or outdoors person and uh, a, a wonderful photographer and storyteller um, that many of us follow and appreciate. You, you spoke of when you went to that trapper's cabin and sort of you see the pelts and you hear the stories. And there, I think many of us who, who were brought up maybe in more urban areas, I can speak to myself uh, with my experience, but there was this romanticization of trapping of our history of Canada in that way of these brave people who went out and tamed the wilderness for us and so on and so forth. And I, I, I still see that when people talk about trapping as part of our heritage. And I'm curious for you, has your experience with that shifted? Because I certainly long before I knew about this stuff, I just accepted what I was taught. Uh, and I think most people do when it comes to that, right? Yep, trapping was part of our history. It was essential, blah, 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 blah. And then you don't think about it anymore. Uh, so I'm curious if your your personal views on it sort of through that journey also changed. Yeah, they certainly did. Um, you know, with Trapper Ivan, he was a, a, a guy that lived in the bush. You know, his cabin was literally in the middle of the bush in the Yukon. Mm -hmm. um, not near any settlements, towns, anything. Um, and so when I saw his way of life, it, it just it almost fed in more into that romantic notion yeah. of, you know, the Jeremiah Johnson snowshoeing off into the woods and doing the traps and stuff. And I didn't really get into the, the talking about the traps or looking at the traps with them. Mm -hmm. All I was looking at was the pelts and hearing the stories and hearing him going yeah. off in the woods. And, you know, he had this old broken down snowmobile and he would just get it going every winter, and that would be go off mm -hmm. and, and do his wolverine trapping and his wolf trapping and his lynx trapping. And 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 to me, it was just so fascinating. And I totally fell into that um kind of love affair that uh, you know, even as a kid, you you're exposed a bit to it, like you said. Yeah. You grew up in Canada and it's part of you know, part of our history. And it's interesting because I have actually learned um through doing my geneal genealogical history that I have very deep ties to the Canadian fur trade. Um, so my mm -hmm. romantic um, side of things actually goes back to my, you know, my, my fifth great grandfather was one of the founding members of uh, the Northwest company, which was, oh, Hudson wow. Bay's, which was Hudson Bay's biggest competitor. Yeah. My sixth great grandfather was one of the founding members of the Beaver Club, which was the bourgeoisie fur trading club of mm -hmm. English speakers in Montreal in the late 1700s. Um, you know, so I have all, uh, sorry, late 1600s. So I have all of these, um, amazing ties going back. And, but then as I started to get into, to trapping and it's particularly as I, I look at it in modern society, it's not the same anymore. Yeah. You know, first of all, people are not doing this to put food on the table. You know, that that's not to say that there aren't the odd trapper out there that that is, you know, eating their links or whatever. But it's not the, the main purpose behind this is not to make money anymore. There just isn't money to be made in this uh, in, in recreational trapping anymore. So they're doing it for the love of it, for the thrill of it. And so this is where my real disconnect with trappers comes about. We love the outdoors. We love animals, uh, you know, all this stuff. But then the, the total disconnect of, well, then why are you killing it? 
you love yeah. animals, you love nature, you love being out there, you love the challenge. Why not just pick up a camera? Um, yeah. Why not set out trail cameras? Why Why does there have to be that killing part at the end? Um, and so as I, I, you know, delved into the trapping industry, and I see that nowadays, you know, it's it's snowmobiles and it's trucks and it's driving up and down roads and it's checking snare sets and, and box traps and conibears and so on that are just set right off the side of the road. I mean, almost every single trap line I have been either invited to visit or I've gone out and looked for has been right off a forest service road or a logging road or right near a community, uh, you know, super easy to access. There's still the odd trap line out there where people are going way off in, in snowmobiles into the woods. But by and large, um, you know, the romantic notion is is kind of gone. They still get the cabin in the woods, um, but but they're just out there killing things now. Um, yeah. There's very little management going on. There's not stewardship. There's no exploration of new lands. You know, it's not settling the West. And of course, now if you look at, you know, what the fur trade did, um, yep. you know, there, there's good aspects to it, but there's terrible aspects to it from what it did to to many indigenous people and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, separating the West in particular, but, but also the East in, you know, 1600s, um, 1700s. So, yeah, I think it, it, the, that romantic notion is gone altogether. Um, I do still find when I chat to individual trappers that sometimes there is still that connection. Mm -hmm. There is still that love of the outdoors. It's just that one little extra step they take of killing things that, yeah. you know, why, why do you have, have to be out there killing a pine marten and skinning it for that extra 10 bucks? Yeah, um, you know, you spend that much in your gas money and your snowmobile or your truck driving out, and you know, it, it when you actually delve into the statistics of trapping, um, you know, the average trapper across Canada probably makes about two dollars an hour, one to two dollars an hour. Um, you know, the the most that a trapper might make, and these are not my words. This is actually president of the Yukon Trappers Association says, you know, a lucky, really good trapper with a great territory might make fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah, you know, we we all know what the cost of living is nowadays. You know, even in the Yukon, fifteen thousand yeah. dollars a year doesn't do a thing for you. Especially uh, when you start adding in your additional costs and things like that that may not be incorporated into the equations being used. There's two notes that you had said uh, that I'd like to touch on uh, quickly: steel jaw leg hole trap. That's the toothed leg hole trap. Steel leg hole traps still very much out there. Now they've got what is it? A, a one and a half millimeter spacer or two millimeters of rubber or laminate on them to make them quote humane. Yeah, I don't think people realize that leg hole traps are still totally a thing within Canada yep. and the U.S. And they're constantly, you know, I've, I've actually seen them. I've uh, seen them set out. I've seen them uh, sprung. I know someone who had their dog caught in one. I know someone who stepped in one, a, a person who accidentally yep. got caught in one and thankfully had someone else with them to be able to to uh, release the trap. Um, yeah, they're, uh, you know, all that's been removed is the steel jawed part, the tooth part, yeah, um, which really tore into the limbs and stuff. But now it's still got this exact same force, still cool. snaps on an animal's legs and holds it, restrains it. So the animal tries to wring itself off. It tries to, you know, pull its leg out, chew its leg off, um, struggles, thrashes around. I mean, it's still, yeah, it's a terrible. Yeah. There, there's a lot of terrible, terrible suffering that still goes on out there in the Canadian wilderness that people just aren't aware of. Um, snares, leg hole traps. Conibears, you know, conibears are designed such that an animal just has to enter it absolutely perfectly for Ooh. it to work the way that it's supposed to work. And there's been, you know, we, as part of episode one, we do quite a bit of interviewing with uh, Dr. Gilbert Proul, who's uh, uh, essentially an expert trapper. He ran uh, the trapping research facility for the Canadian government, for the Fur Institute of Canada in Alberta from 1988 to 1993 and developed eight different trap modifications in that time to make them more efficient, more humane. And they only accepted one little part of one of the modifications. Um, mm -hmm. And the rest of the modifications were thrown out and said, no, we can't do that. No, it's too expensive. No, I can't, no, we're not, we're not changing anything. 
So, and that, that's, that's back then, you know, you can imagine now yeah. this testing facility is still open. And we talk about this in episode one, um, which is called the truth about snares and incredibly this facility has been running for 30 years and yes. it has been 22 years since they've published any kind of scientific paper. Uh, mm -hmm. They did do one um, that wasn't peer reviewed that was about computer model simulation. Uh, but absolutely nothing about, you know, oh, this would be a better trap or this would be yeah. a better way of doing this. Or instead, they've just been killing animals, testing things out and keeping it to themselves. Who knows what the heck they're doing there? Yeah, people, uh, I think you're right. People really don't know. And that's often when we see the dangers um, hit closer to home. So we're, we're talking a lot about wildlife suffering, but there's also pets and people, as you mentioned. At the fur bears, we try and track those, but because there's no mandatory reporting of pets being caught in traps, we rely on uh, uh, people letting us know or media reports, FOIs, things like that. Uh, I interviewed someone out east whose uh, dog got stepped into a leg hole trap. Uh, very, it was legally set. It was positioned and tagged down the way it's supposed to be. And dog stepped into it. By the time the owner got to the dog, she had broken about 20 teeth biting at the trap, just out of wow. pure terror and pain. Uh, and then they had to fly to Montreal. It was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in damage and vet bills uh, for this poor dog who ended up being OK. But again, that's that was, you know, if there had been a sign on the side of this road traps in place, if there had been requirements to set it further from the road, 10 meters or something, as opposed to three feet from the road. All of these things could have prevented it, but they don't. And it's interesting that you bring up at Vegreville because that's the impression. Uh, and speaking of that, the snares, you talked about a snare circle, and this is another thing folks typically don't know until they stumble across them. Um, but it actually, you know, I'm going to let you uh, describe it because I know you've come across them. Uh, so when folks do, they set up these snare circles with the bait pile in the middle out in the wilderness. Uh, what the intent of that is, yeah. The, the one that I have visited the most, which was um, just south of Kootenai National Park in British Columbia, so very close to Invermere uh, in British Columbia. Um, so drive down a logging road, uh, about a fairly nice, wide, sort of three-lane gravel road um, for uh, about seven kilometers off of a paved highway, mm -hmm. and then take a right-hand turn and drive another five kilometers outside of the national park now. So once I get off the main gravel road, go five kilometers more down a littler logging road, but still good shape. Mm -hmm. Take a left-hand turn, drive another half a kilometer down a, a little thin road, but still nice normal road that you can pretty much drive any time of year. And at the end, there's just a little parking area and you pull your truck in and you get out and you walk 40 meters. And there's a bunch of roadkill dumped there. Um, I have seen moose, I have seen uh, elk, I've seen bighorn sheep, I've seen deer there. So the trapper brings his truck in, dumps this big bait pile, mm -hmm. um, leaves it for a month or two, November, December, lets a bunch of stuff start coming in and feeding on it. And then uh, when I go back in December, usually right before Christmas, he has set his snares out and uh, it's last year was 32 different snares um, that were basically on every single little possible trail that any animal coming in towards that bait pile um, would would intersect with. And he would leave a few, he would leave the big main corridor, the big road open, mm -hmm. um, the, the little parking area, he'd leave that open so that animals could come in and, you know, anything sneaking through the trees was going to get caught. But then the other animals would still keep coming in and get the reward. So they would keep coming back. And, the, the, you know, the, the goal there is to, you, for instance, with a wolf pack, you have eight different wolves and you capture three of them. You want those other five wolves to come back so you can catch them again at some point, too. So you try and design it such that they will keep coming back for that reward mm -hmm. and sort of ignoring the fact that they're losing family members. Now, it often doesn't work. Often you're... You know, First time of the year, you get a couple of wolves and then that'll be it. Um, just totally depends on the trapper's expertise and on, on how well they've, they've um, set their snares because, of course, snares can, you know, catch an animal on the shoulder or they can catch animals that aren't even intended, uh, lynx or cougars or moose or caribou or or things like that. So it it's a 
it's a pretty shocking environment to walk into. And I know I keep using that word, but there, there's really no more apt word to use. Um, you know, you walk into this beautiful little patch of forest and there's a big bait pile in the middle and then every little trail leading into it, right attached to the tree trunk are these loops of snares and they're just cheap little things, you know, 30 bucks, um, 20, 30 bucks that you can buy each one and uh, set with a little tiny uh, lock on them and they cause all kinds of problems. You know, I, I've, I've gone in and I look at these, this 32, these 32 set that were, that were looked at last year and uh, the loops are all different sizes. And, you know, if you actually went in there with a tape measure, measured them all, you'd find some are 15 inches, some are 12, some are 10. You know, so they're, they're not even, yeah, it's, it's, it really is at this point, it's, it's almost a homemade device. Like yeah. You can, you can legally in Canada make them at home, but you know these weren't. These were ones that they bought at a, a Cabela's or whatever, and and uh, uh, got some snare wire and put these little locks on and and put them together. But it uh, it's really quite sad. Um, I remember every time I've walked into a snare set, I walk in with a lot of fear of what I'm going to find. Mm. Um, and I, I've found found some pretty horrific stuff. Nothing alive, um, but a lot of skinned out creatures and horrible grimaces and places where you can see the struggle that went on blood everywhere and trees torn to shreds um I, i've also seen some you know it, some of the trappers have posed the animals after they skin them and I, I can only assume they do it to take pictures of it which i don't i don't get at all but you know seeing animals posed like humans up against a tree um, I've got pictures of all this stuff, but I'm never going to show them to anybody. It's too gruesome. Yeah. It's, you know, why, why would you, I, there's a lot of stuff like that, that just, that it, it furthers the disconnect of, you know, well, if you truly love nature and you really are environmental stewards, what the heck are you doing? Like, you know, I've got a degree in wildlife management. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I don't get to go out there and manage wildlife populations, why does some guy who goes and takes a three day course get to go do it? And that's literally what it is in yep. most of Canada is a weekend course. And then you're qualified. You just have to go out and buy a, well, you can do it on private land with that, just that certification, or you can go out and buy a registered fur management license uh, for management area. Um, and, and that's across Canada, yeah. you know, whether you live in Nunavut or, or PEI or British Columbia. Um, doesn't really matter. There's trap lines all over the place. Um, and you can go out and buy them and you can be trapping anything from raccoons and muskrats all the way up to wolves and, and lynx and, and things like that. Apex predators that are actually helping to control the ecosystem. So extraordinarily disruptive to biodiversity, um, to ecosystem health. And it's all done by one person in each of these areas mm -hmm. that has literally no training in wildlife biology um, so that that's where it, that makes me really upset, particularly with my background and knowing that I have that training. I I mean, how come I can't go do stuff like that? Yeah. And and why does it all come down to really in in almost every province? And in fact, I think it is every province and territory. It literally comes down to one wildlife biologist who's sitting in an office making decisions on oh you know let's let's open up the harvest quotas for. Uh, for fisher lynx and fox for the rest of the year why not let's just go go crazy and kill whatever you can yeah because that literally just happened like yeah. four days ago in alberta and that's just a wildlife biologist sitting in an office deciding that well you know maybe they maybe they haven't caught enough this year because the snow conditions aren't great so so let's just open it up so they can try and get a bit more money and try and kill a few more animals yeah it, it, it's as ludicrous as it sounds I think, too, what's fascinating is it, it completely ignores aspects of ecology and biology that are extremely well established at this point. So, as you said, apex predators will removing one random wolf from a wolf pack. And we know it's random because there's no way to select which animal is going to go into a trap. One random wolf from a wolf pack could have an incredible impact on the social structure of that wolf pack, on the development of the ecosystem, on their ability to properly hunt. And that is, again, at this point, very well accepted, I think, scientifically, but for some reason is in no way reflected by any of the trapping policy. 
um, which it really is shocking. It's interesting that, you know, I'll step onto the hunting side of things for just a second, because that what, you know, hunting very popular in Canada is about 6% of Canadians hunt and mm. put food on the table. And it, uh, right now the wildlife management system is what's called the North American wildlife management model. And, and some of the tenets of the model, there's seven key tenets. Yep. One of them is that wildlife should not be used as a resource. Well, what the heck is commercial fur trapping then? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally using a public resource so a few people can make a few bucks by killing animals. Um, what about the rest of us? You know, why? what about me? I want to drive down those logging roads. I would love to see a fisher. I would love to see a lynx. I would love to take photographs of a wolf down one of these logging roads. But literally, as a professional wildlife photographer, I am stuck with the national parks because that's the only place where these animals aren't trapped and shot. Yeah. And where they learn that humans are not just a terrible thing to avoid at all times. Um, and then it's really quite sad um, that our national parks have kind of become these little islands mm -hmm. uh, where, where animals, and, and even then, we're still loving them to death with tourism. Oh, yeah. So, it's a, that, yeah, that's it's a whole a, different series. <laughs> whole different, yeah, exactly. So, but the, the commercial trapping industry, um, I think, you know, it, it, it had its time. Mm -hmm. um, it was very important in the development of Canada as we see it now, whether for the good or for the bad. Um, it certainly had a lot of historical significance, but in today's day and age, we've just reached a point where it is time that society needs to know what's going on and needs to take steps to reform trapping altogether and to, to get certain elements out of there completely. Yeah. There is just no need for snares anymore. There is no way to make a snare that is efficient and humane and that kills quickly. It just simply cannot be done with canids that have their blood vessels running so deep in their neck with so much musculature and fur, particularly in the winter when the pelt is thick, um, a snare just can't do the job. Yeah. Um, and, and we already know there's really no biological reason to be doing this. Um, so let's just cut it out altogether. And I think this is the, this is the goal of this whole trap in the past campaign is to get total reform going, get the public so enraged, that they start writing emails and getting uh, in touch with their MLAs and getting stuff changed within their own province or their own territory um, so that we can start having our public resource, our wildlife, um, being by managed by all of us or for the benefit of all of us, not mm -hmm. just for a select few that are out there killing things. Well said, and I, I'd like to sort of wrap up a bit on the documentary itself is going to be, the series is going to be incredibly impactful. Uh, you and the Exposed team do such a great job with this medium, and everybody should check out all of the Exposed videos, especially if you're into wildlife or the environment. With this one, and I think this is an important note to sort of look at and perhaps wrap on, is is this film going to be purely emotional graphic footage? Because I think there is always personally for me there is the worry of that because i don't I, I i know i don't need to see that per se um but i think that's also then what those who call us quote antis expect right is oh it's just an emotional response to this and you don't understand and all of these kinds of criticisms that we'll hear I personally think this documentary series is going to really challenge those, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that that concept of balancing visual footage of what's actually happening with facts and interviews and so on, and not relying wholly on an emotional angle. Yeah, we um, so the the emotional angle that we have chosen for this series is more having myself, um, Kim, again my co-founder with Exposed um speaking to camera mm -hmm. we've stayed away from any of the footage so so the re reason i say that about kim and myself is neither of us would necessarily be considered an expert on trapping neither of us have been trappers although kim is now he went through the course mm -hmm. did the course so that he could say you know I've, i'm now certified to be a trapper i i don't think i can be i don't think a three-day course is enough to to truly prepare me um but uh, but but we've also got a number of the experts, so it's really hard to argue with the science and the biological fact. Um, so we've stayed away entirely from 
showcasing wolves caught in traps and coyotes struggling and anything dead in a trap. So there's none of that imagery um, within this series because we want everyone to be able to watch it, not have to worry that there's going to be something that's going to shock them in there. There's really only one scene of anything and you really can't tell what's going on. And that's the wolf caught by a back leg mm, yep. uh, in a trap, but kind of through the trees. You can't really tell what's, what's happening there. It's just in relation to, uh, to one of our trapping experts that we interview. And that that's a guy called Craig Comstock, who's not a biologist, but he's the one who discovered a wolf in a trap four winters ago and has become a self-proclaimed trapping expert since just dove into it, read every study out there, talked to government officials, um, just has educated himself. But besides him, we've got Dr. Gilbert Pruel, mm -hmm. who's an actual trapper, a trapping researcher, um, literally knows as much about traps as any person on earth. Yep. Um, so very difficult to argue with him in any meaningful way. <laughs> Um, when when he's literally tried all these traps yeah. and knows how they all work. He's, he's literally yeah. written the book on snares, literally. Absolutely, yes. yeah. And then our, our other one in episode one, um, other trapping expert is is Carter Niemeyer. Yes. Who was the, he was uh, U.S. Wildlife Services. Um, he was wildlife control effectively for them, right? wildlife control. So he was in charge of killing wildlife for a long, long time in the U.S. and then became the wolf recovery coordinator for Idaho, took part in the trapping of wolves in Jasper uh, to bring them down and release in Yellowstone. Um, he, as he says in the, the first episode, has probably skinned 6,000 predators in his life. So he has done more killing than you can possibly imagine. And, and you know, is an absolute expert at snares, leg hold traps, everything, um, because he's used it all for decades and decades. And he's just turned a corner and decided he wants to start speaking out about this stuff. And uh, it's, it's really amazing um, what he talks about. And, and again, really hard to argue with that. Yeah. You know, he's just talking about the science. He's a professional wildlife biologist. Um, and an expert trapper. Mm -hmm. And how do you argue against that? You know, you, you, we're certainly going to have the trapping industry is going to speak up. I'm sure they're going to be in arms over this. Mm -hmm. um, we hope they are. Um, but I think we've laid out a really clear plan. And then as we get into episodes two and three, which start to talk about historical significance of trapping, the economy of trapping, um, you know, the, the using it as a livelihood, that sort of argument. The argument that trappers are environmental stewards, that they're managing biodiversity, um, that there's any kind of science behind it, all that we get into the final episode and we talk about the ethics and the morals of it and and really bring it bring it back home. And and through all of that, we get into more experts. Um, Dr. Adrian Trevez, mm -hmm. who is one of the world's leading carnivore biologists, he actually runs a full-on carnivore lab yep. at the University of Wisconsin. Um yeah, so we we we've really brought in the experts. So it's not just me talking, and it's not just Kim talking. We still give our opinions to get a bit of emotion into it, mm -hmm. uh, because the scientists talk the science, and then we come in with our arguments to to. We still want to fire people up. Yeah, um, it's an know, upsetting that, topic, right? That's it that's not going away, topic, no yeah. matter how you shoot but it. We don't want to we don't want to use the visuals to do that. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of pretty footage in there, mm -hmm. you know, so so even if even if people's eyes gloss over for a minute or two while we're talking about, you know, international trapping agreements and stuff, you know, there's gorgeous wolves and links. Yeah. And, and well, know. I got to say, I watched the, the preview of the first episode um, and I really appreciate the visual aesthetic and the music like that the, the ambiance for the for the entire thing is awesome. I think the, the music, uh, the editing you've done on all of the footage, uh, the way you're introducing graphics is very compelling. It's not you know, it's not my version from the, the, the print news version where it's here's a pie chart, read it, then you know what's in it. <laughs> It's it's the very well made animations and things like that that help explain it, um, but it does feature so much of your footage and like you said it's sort of interspersed between some of these topics, and it's almost like a little reminder as you go through it of this is what we're doing it for this and little that box was exactly what yeah, we're aiming for this this guy sitting here looking around and then catching the camera. 
that moment just goes, oh, yeah, that's why. For Simpsons fans, uh, you're doing it for her. It's that sort of interspersed through it. And I think it's a beautiful way to keep it from being uh, uh, just uh, enraging purely, right? Like, it's not just rage. It's also the reminder of the beauty and of the importance and the connection yeah. to it. So I think that is is very lovely. And I think people are really going to... Uh, uh, both enjoy the series because of how well it's made and how it looks and feels, but also, as you said, get upset by what they're going to learn and uh, get involved with Exposed and the Fur Bears and take action. And I think more than anything else, spread the word. Sometimes that can be huge because, as you said at the top, people just don't know still. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's the key is... With this whole series, almost more than causing rage in people, we want to educate and raise awareness and get them to go, wow, that was crazy. I can't believe that. And share it. Yeah. Have you seen this? Have you you, you got to check this out. You love wildlife. You should watch this. Mm -hmm. and, and get that spreading sort of word of mouth and, and people emailing to their friends and, you know, put, putting posts on social media and things like that. And following up after the, the videos, I mentioned earlier, I alluded to it, that we're going to be continuing sort of a social media campaign. And we have so many little interesting tidbits here and there um, that are just going to be social media posts that um, fur bears and exposed are going to be sharing. And so people, you know, if you're not already follow each of us on social media, um, watch for these different little things. There's going to be all kinds of interesting. And I can just give you a, a quick little example. So in British Columbia, uh, in the interior of British Columbia, fishers, Ooh. which are a large pine marten type creature, super rare in lots of Canada. Um, in British Columbia, interior of British Columbia, they're actually endangered. Yeah. And so they've been, there was a trapping season until very recently on them, and they've just shut it down. And interestingly, they're still allowed to trap martens. So and they use these martin boxes that fishers get caught in. So what the, what the, provincial government has done in association with the trapping industry or trapping association in British Columbia is they have simply told trap trappers, here's what we recommend you do. You switch to this more expensive box. Mm -hmm. It's not mandatory. You don't have to. You can still trap all you want where all these fishers are. And we'd really like you to use this box, but you don't have to. Yeah. So just, you know, shell out more money, buy this other box, create this other modification um, take all this time, uh, but you know what? You don't really have to. You can just keep trapping Pine Martin mm -hmm. and get these fishers by accident. I mean, it's ridiculous when you consider that this is an endangered species there. Yeah. Well, I think, too, what uh, an interesting follow-up to that to ask you is you, you spoke about going on trap lines, both with trappers and coming across them and looking for them and so on. How many times have you seen a government agent inspecting one of those trap lines or seen a government agent while you were out looking for them? Uh, zero and zero. Yeah. So the... never ever seen a never ever seen a government. I mean, there's it, it's impossible. You know, you you look at Alberta as an example, the size of Alberta and the number of conservation officers we have. Um, absolutely impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, it just yeah. The 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 conservation officers are so busy dealing with human wildlife conflict and with um um hunting poaching issues. Uh, a lot of pollution. Like that. Time to go and regulate what's going on in trap line. I mean, come on, that that's ridiculous. So that that's again one of the things that the series will point out is just the, the total lack of regulation. Yeah, you know, there's no mandatory check times on traps. There's no mandatory bag limits for a lot of species. You can kill as many wolves as you want in almost all of Canada, mm -hmm. which is just insane when you think about it. Um, you know, no mandatory signage. So that's how pets get. You know, people don't even know there's trap lines, yeah. and their dog runs two meters off of a road and gets into a leg hold trap or into a snare. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh so th there's a lot of really ridiculous things in this, the, this whole trap in the past campaign. Uh, I'm super thrilled that uh, we've been able to partner with the fur bears. Uh, I've been, I've already been working with you guys for, I guess it's a while. close to a decade. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't uh, know. so this we, is just, let's make that a year or two. I don't like the fact that it's been a decade. That's making me feel old. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's been six months. Yeah, there you go. 
uh, but yeah, it's it's an exciting time, and I, we're all thrilled to see it come out. And uh, the the emails back and forth are, are furious as we make final adjustments to things. Um, and uh, we encourage everyone trappedinthepast.com. <laughs> And you can see the documentary series as it comes out, follow Exposed Wildlife Conservation and the Fur Bears, too, with lots of great information Absolutely. coming to that website. Yeah, thanks so much, Michael. That was, that was great. You can see episode one of Trapped in the Past now at trappedinthepast.com or on the Exposed Wildlife Conservancy YouTube page. Links to these and action items are available in this week's show notes. We cannot thank enough everyone who is sharing and commenting on the first episode. And I hope you'll all subscribe and stay tuned for the next two episodes as they drop through February 2024. I want to thank John for sharing time during a busy schedule with me and all of you for listening. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. <laughs> <laughs>